Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. How's everybody doing? Happy New Year. It is 2023, day one of 2023. So I decided that uh, I wanted to start doing my cook-alongs again. I figured I'd start with tacos. I like this as kind of a boilerplate base thing to cook. I'm very familiar with it. I love doing it for several years. All I did was cook tacos every Tuesday for my family. And that's actually what started the whole Cook Along Live thing to begin with. When the pandemic started about three years ago at this point, um, I started doing tacos. I did tacos on a live stream and it kind of picked up from there. So it's been a lot of fun. Unfortunately, last year wasn't a great year for me. Uh, my dad passed in March, if you remember watching uh, that Cook Along Live. It was a little bit difficult for me to put together. And then I did one more after that, and then I just really couldn't bring myself to do the whole setup every week uh, anymore to, to kind of pull this through. However, um, I think I'm back in a space where I think I can start doing that again. So expect a little bit more, a little bit more cooking coming back from this channel. You will notice that I've also moved it to a new channel, its own channel. Instead of using my normal YouTube channel, which I use for aviation and video games and things like that, I'm going to put all of my Cook Along live streams on their own channel. This one, youtube.com forward slash cook along live. Uh, it's a, I've also got a bunch of other social profiles as well. Most of them are cookalong.live. So if you go to like Instagram, and TikTok and a couple of the other places and look for that. That's going to be me. Uh, on Facebook, somebody actually registered an account called Cook Along Live and uh, hasn't posted anything there. But unfortunately, I can't use that until they decide to delete their account. So on Facebook, you can find me going to Cook Along Live stream and uh, that'll be my information. Anyway, let's get cooking. Oh, one last thing. I also have a website. I put together a website, cookalong.live. You can go there for all of my old recipes. I'm still uploading some of the, I mean, I, I made 60 videos on my on my previous run, and uh, so I'm slowly getting those uploaded and, and integrated into the website. As I'm building those out, I'm also uploading the new stuff. So as a new video comes out, as a new live stream comes out, it'll be uploaded there with a full recipe, ingredients, etc. I also recently just put a page there called uh, Upcoming Live Streams. You can always click on that page and it will show you exactly what's coming up in the future with ingredients. So instead of having to go and find my Instagram and like search through the or search through my Instagram posts to find what I'm going to be cooking, you can just go to cookalong.live and uh, go to the upcoming live streams link at the top and you'll see everything that is coming up in the future, the date, the time, as well as the ingredients list. So it should be a lot easier for people to kind of get themselves together and get the ingredients that they need in order to cook along live. I'm also going to be editing these down into, um, I'm going to say just produced videos where instead of long form, like now where I'm just kind of talking, uh, it's going to be right to the point and more edited so that if you don't want to sit through in some cases a three or four hour live stream if we're doing something involved and you just want to get the 15 minute version that'll be available for you so all of that is coming soon to the youtube channel and i'm going to stop live streaming to facebook youtube and twitch all at the same time um, it's just way too much to manage all of that youtube has the best upload quality uh the best audio quality and Overall, it's just the nicest experience. Uh, I'm not super happy with Twitch and Facebook only really lets you upload in 720p, so it's not really even all that great. Anyway, let's get into some tacos. So this time, I already did the salsa and guacamole. So I already have those kind of sitting here and ready to go. We're not going to take an hour to, you know, put those together. If you don't have a salsa or a guacamole that you like to use, you can go and look at some of my previous live streams figure out how to put those together, and you will have those for the future. Otherwise, any salsa and guacamole will work just fine. They're, they're all pretty good. We're going to get our meat going, and then we're going to clean up some of our toppings, namely the cheese and the lettuce. And uh, as far as the meat goes, you'll notice that I've actually kind of already chopped this up. And what I did was, here, it tends to come in a little cardboard carton. It's a little rectangular cardboard carton, and the meat just kind of is ground in one direction and it's layered on top of itself. So I just took a paring knife and just cut across the grind 
uh, direction and just kind of scooped it off onto a plate. This allowed me to, number one, break it up. So when I go to put it into the pan, when I go to put that into the pan, I'm not trying to break it up in there with a spatula. Uh, I don't know if you guys are, uh, you guys have experience with that, but it's not very fun. Usually grease goes all over the place because as you're doing that, it's splattering all over the place. And uh, this just, it takes a little bit of extra step up front, but saves you a whole lot of work once you get to actually cooking. So, little quick tip for you. This also allows you to season the meat a little bit ahead of time. So I've actually added a little bit of salt to this and left it in the fridge for about three hours just to kind of dry out a little bit. And that gives you nice crispy bits in the pan as you're cooking it, as opposed to everything getting kind of wet and, and gray. Uh, it should be a little bit more crispy. So a couple of little, little pro tips there. I'm gonna set that aside for now. We're actually gonna start with our onion and our garlic. Now, onion is pretty easy to chop. Now, I've got a half of a yellow onion here. And essentially what I did was I cut it in half and then peeled off the skin. You'll find that it's a lot easier to peel off the skin if you've cut the onion in half. And then I just cut off as little of the top as I can. I just want to get that dry bit at the top. I like to call it the cap because it's like a little, little school cap. And we're just going to kind of get rid of that, throw it into the compost. And then as far as dicing an onion, pretty simple. You can go horizontal if you want to. Just put your hand on, you know, flat on top like this. And then just kind of slice almost all the way through, but not quite all the way through. And do that maybe one or two times. You don't have to do this. Some people say that it gets you thinner slices, but honestly, I've never really noticed a difference. And then once you get a couple of those cuts horizontally, you can just start slicing vertically through the onion. If little bits kind of start falling off like that, don't worry too much about them. And again, you're not cutting all the way through the onion. You're going about, I'd say 95% of the way through the onion. If you happen to cut all the way through, it's not the end of the world. But if you can keep the onion kind of together, it just makes it easier to dice it when we get to this point. So we've got our onion sliced. You can see a couple of pieces have kind of started falling off. Not a problem. We'll just kind of set them back on. And then I'll take any of these little bits that have kind of separated from the main onion, and I'll just kind of rock my knife over them like this. And I'll just kind of chop them up separately. We want this to be a fine dice, but it doesn't have to be super, super fine. Just want it to be fine enough that when we put it in the pan, it cooks down pretty quick. Now for the rest of the onion, we've cut it a couple times horizontally. We've cut it vertically all the way through, or you know, 95% of the way all the way through. What we're going to do is we're going to take our hand. We're going to make a little, almost like a shelf for the knife to kind of go up and down on. We use the back of our knuckle here, and we're going to take the tips of our fingers put them on top of the onion, use our pinky and our thumb to kind of squeeze it. And then we just use the flat of our knuckle to align the knife to where we want it to go. And we just cut right down. And just do that as slowly or fast as you are comfortable with doing. Don't worry about going super fast, but the more comfortable you get with this, the quicker and safer you can cut through onions, tomatoes, really any kind of a vegetable. And you'll notice that even when I have a few little bits on the table, on the cutting board, I'll still use the same kind of technique. I'll just use the flat of my knuckle to hold down whatever it is that I'm planning on chopping. And then I just rock the knife over. And really what that does is it makes it very, very difficult to cut yourself. Usually if you're, you know, holding an onion like this, I mean, there's a lot of finger there that you could potentially catch. Not ideal. However, if you have your knuckles kind of curled over like this, and you can use them as a flat for your knife, it's very, very difficult unless something slips and kicks the knife in. Even then, it's probably going to go down with your fingers as opposed to catching any of your skin. And just go as, as slow as you need to until you get used to it, and then the more comfortable you get with it, the faster and faster you can go.
go ahead and get this. Now that I've got like just the end of the onion here, I'm actually not going to keep going backwards. I might cut just a little bit more there. But now what I can do is I can actually lay just this kind of root end flat. And I can just make a couple of cuts through like this. And dice it up like so. And then the same thing with the other side. Just a couple of cuts like so. And what I'm trying to do is keep as much of the onion flat against the board as possible so that it doesn't rock and roll around on me as I'm trying to kind of cut through it. And then the same thing with the back here. I'm actually going to use some of the lines from when I cut most of the way through it earlier. And just kind of make them a little bit longer. And now you'll notice that I still have a little bit more of the heel if I really want to. I can go through like that. And then all I'm left for with waste is this. So all we've taken off is just the very kind of tip of the half of the onion. And we're left with just the very root end of the back. All of the rest of that half of the onion has been chopped up. Put that in the compost. And our onion is ready to go. If you really feel like you want to kind of dice this up even more, you certainly can. There's nothing that's going to stop you from doing that. Just kind of pile it up. I like to make it almost like a little rectangle and not too tall. And then what I'll do is I'll take my knife and I'll just rock it through. I don't do this very often. Usually what we have right here is diced just fine for what we're going to be doing. However, if you have a thicker dice, maybe you're not super comfortable with a knife, doing a rock like this where you just kind of use the, the folds in your knuckles or on the, on the insides of your hands on the actual knife, and then you use that to kind of hold down the tip while you rock the back up and down. It's a great way to make sure you don't cut any of your fingers because your fingers are nowhere near the blade. All right, <clears throat> onion is ready to go. I've got a nice clove of garlic. I want this guy chopped up like the onion. And I'm going to essentially find what I think is the flattest side, which I'm going to say is this side here. I'm going to put that down against the board. And then I'm going to go horizontal first. And I'm again going to go about 95% of the way through. I don't want to cut all the way through because I want it to kind of hold itself together. But I am going to cut most of the way through. And just be careful with your fingers when you're doing this. I like to kind of put as much of my hand or fingers on the very top of whatever I'm cutting as possible. Like so. And now we're going to cut vertically. So we've cut it this way. And you'll notice I've got some pretty big chunks. That's fine. Don't worry too much about that. When I cut vertically this way, I'm going to be a little bit more careful about how close together I'm chopping or cutting through it. And that's going to give us a nice fine dice. We've cut it thick one way. We're going to cut it super thin the other way. And then when we cut it the third way, we're going to make that super fine as well. All in all, all of the pieces will be small. Don't worry too much about getting all of them super close together. It's not necessary. And you'll notice that again, I'm kind of rolling my fingers and creating a little bit of a path for the knife blade. When I get closer to the top, I'm just going to pinch it and just make very sure that the blade is not going towards my fingers as I come down. There we go. And then I'm just going to cut very fine this way as well. And you'll notice that we have a really nice, fine dice on our garlic. Now you might be wondering, Rob, we're making tacos. Why are you cutting up garlic and onions? This is actually going to serve as the base to our meat. It's going to add a nice depth of flavor and make it just a little bit more tasty. The, the flavor is going to be a little bit more rounded. Now the garlic, I may do that rocking thing just once. And I'm just going to try and get it as finely diced as I can. But we started with a really good base with our cross cut, which means we have to do less work here. Perfect. 
There we go. And garlic tends to be a little bit more sticky than onion, so if it's sticking to your fingers, that's totally normal. All right, we are good to go with that. Now, I'm going to be cooking today in a cast iron skillet. You don't have to use cast iron. You can absolutely use nonstick if you'd like. I prefer cast iron because it gets hot. It takes a while to kind of heat up and evenly get heat, get hot, but it holds the heat very well, especially when you add ingredients like onions and garlic that bring the temperature of the cooking surface down a bit. So we're going to go ahead and get this going. I'm not going super high. You can see that the temperature here is uh, 375. If you don't have an induction cooktop or if it's not precise to a temperature value, we're like at medium high, on the low end of medium high. And I'm just going to kind of let this heat up a bit. I'm actually going to add a little bit of vegetable oil to the pan. Not much. The meat is going to be releasing plenty of fat. However, we're going to add our onions and our garlic first. And I want these guys to start sauteing without any, we don't have any fat in the pan yet. So we need just a little bit of vegetable oil or olive oil. I'm going to say that's probably about a teaspoon. Really, you don't need that much. And I'm just going to kind of coat the bottom of the pan with that. And my induction plate turns off if there's no pan on top of it. So as I'm kind of rotating it to get even coverage, you're going to notice that it's turning off a bit. And grab our spatula. Now, I don't need this to be like ripping hot or anything like that. I just want it to start getting to the point where all of our veggies can start sizzling in here. And we are going to start with our onion. And that's exactly what you want. Just a nice, gentle sizzle. Go ahead and take your time to put all of the onion in. And we don't want to put, we don't want to get the pan too hot because what will end up happening is we'll burn the onion before it has a chance to kind of cook down. And that's not what we're looking for. We want this to be like medium high. We'll probably turn it down just a bit, turn it down to maybe medium low. We want to get our onions translucent and maybe just starting to brown, but we're not going for like a rich caramelization or anything like that. Get them nice and mixed around in the oil. Get them into a nice even layer. And we'll add just a bit of salt. You don't need too much yet. But what this will help with is the onions will start releasing a little bit of the moisture that they have inside of them. And it'll evaporate a bit quicker. How was everybody's new year? Y'all have a good time? I was up till midnight. We were watching uh, Lord of the Rings. Love those movies. They're very long. Takes a while to get through them. I also made a perfect prime rib, which was delicious. Those are some things that I'd really like to cook on the channel, cook on the um, Cook Along Live show. Unfortunately, a lot of the time on that is just letting it sit in the oven, so wouldn't be very entertaining to watch, so I'd have to come up with some more interesting sides to, to get going. All right, so I'm going to turn this down just a bit. As the onions get a little bit translucent, you can see that they're starting to brown a little bit around the edges. You don't want these to get burned. That'll add a little bit of an acrid flavor to your dish. Not ideal when you're making tacos. And those are getting to the point where I'm feeling like they're good. I'm going to take my garlic clove that I chopped up and add it. Now, the reason we add the garlic after the onions are mostly cooked is because it cooks a lot quicker than the onions. 
Usually it's cut a little bit finer. It's easier to get a nice thin dice on it. And it burns really quick. So we want the nice sweet flavor from the onions, but none of that bitterness when it gets overly cooked. So we'll get our onions cooked first, most of the way. Then we'll add our garlic. And what you'll start smelling at this point is onions and garlic. I mean, it smells amazing. If you've never cooked onions and garlic before, this is a great way to start. Now that these guys are all cooked, I'm going to kind of scoop everything off to the edges. It'll slow down the cooking on these because usually the heat kind of comes in the middle on the induction grills. I'm going to start putting in my ground beef. And you'll see how easy this kind of flakes off into the pan because I already took the time to cut it. And I'm not going to have to sit here and like do this kind of a thing in the pan to get it to break apart. I've also been able to leave it in the fridge uncovered on a plate, but uncovered for about, I'd say, three or four hours with a little bit of seasoning, which helps to dry it out. Which, number one, intensifies the beef flavor because some of that moisture evaporates off. But number two, adds a little bit of seasoning right from the beginning. Oh yeah, up until midnight. Love it. Go ahead and put that plate in the sink. And I'm going to get this mixed around. I'm going to get all of the onions and all of the garlic mixed in with the meat. And then they're all going to brown at the same time, at the same rate. This also infuses the flavor of the onions and the garlic in with the meat. Again, I'll just kind of give it a quick shake to layer it into one even layer. There we are. I'll just let that kind of cook off over here for just a second. Now, while I'm waiting on that, I'm really waiting for the meat to brown. Uh, any fat that you have, if you have a fattier beef, like right now I'm using a 90-10. I think it's a 90-10. It's either a 90-10 or an 85-15. Uh, um, as far as like 85% lean or 90% lean meat to 10% fat or 15% fat, um, that fat will start to kind of come out. And you'll, you can see that it's, you know, starting to kind of puddle here. This actually helps prevent the meat from sticking to the pan. So you want to get that starting to kind of come off. It also, if you have too much of it, will prevent your meat from browning, which is why they say to drain it off. If you have a higher percentage fat in here. I think I'm using a 90, I think I'm using a 90-10, so that's fine. You don't have to actually take that and drown, uh, drain it off. The meat will brown just fine. And I am breaking up some of the bigger clumps. Obviously, when you're doing a little bit of a, a, a choppity chop in the container that the meat comes in, it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to have, you know, totally minced meat. Um, however, I didn't have to sit there and, like, break the entire brick of meat up. It makes it a lot easier. Let's go ahead and get our cheese shredded. I like to take one of these little box graters. I personally prefer the bigger side, but you can use the smaller side if you want. And I'm sure that there are ones that have other different thicknesses. I actually used to grate my cheese like this. I think this is the way that everybody's taught to grate their cheese. I actually saw in a couple of videos holding it, or I should say placing it down flat, and then just pushing away from you while holding onto the handle is a much more ergonomic way to do this. And I've got to say, I've been doing it since I saw that, and it just makes grating cheese so much nicer. Because you're pushing down against the entire box grater, the structure of the box grater, not just the side of it. You're not trying to, like, shave into it. You're just pushing down on it. 
which gives you a lot more leverage when you're raiding. And you can just rock through a block of cheese. And of course, any big pieces that come off, you get to eat as a chef. Look at that. My wrist doesn't hurt. My hand doesn't hurt. And I just grated through an entire block of cheese in like a minute or less. There we go. Cheese is done. That's probably the coolest tip I've ever learned. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of illegal, the cheese grating technique, but you know what? It works. So I will continue to illegally grate cheese. <clears throat> I'm just going to put these off to the side right now. Just scoop it into a little pile over here. Of course, you got to take little bits of cheese. That's just what it's there for. I'm going to give the beef a quick mix just to make sure nothing's getting overcooked or seared to the pan. Because that can happen if you forget. And you'll see that it's drying out quite a bit. I don't have any standing oil anymore. It's all kind of boiling off or boiling, cooking back into the meat. If I was using a higher fat percentage, even like an 80-20, I would probably have a puddle of grease down on the bottom, a puddle of uh, beef fat. And I would want to take that and, and drain it off through a colander or something to get most of that out and then put the beef back in. You do want to keep it going and searing just a bit. Uh, you like to get some of those brown bits on the beef. It just helps, number one, with flavor because it gives you some of that Maillard reaction flavor, like from a steak in your taco. Um, but it also gives you those nice crispy bits that everybody likes. Hey, Nini. Hey, Hobbit. How's it going? Great and cheese for like 20 years. And yep. Me too. I did it for about 35 years until I saw <laughs> that flat box grater technique. Um, i trying to remember where I saw it. I know that Frank Proto from uh, the Proto Cooks channel does it. And I think I saw it somewhere before I saw him do it a couple times, but I can't remember exactly where. I would love to give Alton Brown the uh, credit for it, but I don't think it was him. I think it was somebody else. Might have been Chef John from Food Wishes. So you'll notice that I'm just going to kind of keep this moving every so often. I'm going to give it a minute to kind of crisp up and then give it a little bit of a stir. And then as I'm doing this, I'm just going to shake it so that I get a nice lay even layer in the pan, scrape off anything from the sides into the main bit. And the reason you want to scrape down the sides is because the sides are hot. Anything that's kind of stuck to them and just sitting there alone will actually burn to the side of the pan versus if it's kind of part of the group, if you will, it's less likely to burn because there's, it takes more energy to kind of cook it to that point. Yeah, my air reaction is amazing. We got our cheese grated. We're going to start kind of taking apart our lettuce. Now, I love to use romaine lettuce for um, tacos. And the reason I use romaine is it's a little bit more substantial than things like iceberg. You can absolutely use iceberg if that's what you want. I tend to prefer this. It's a little bit more crispy. It's a little bit more substantial. Works a little bit better for me. It takes a little bit of more processing. Not much but it takes a little bit more processing to get it to where it's chopped thin enough to be usable in a taco. So what I'm gonna start doing is actually just kind of peeling the leaves off from the outer leaves. And you can find where the outer leaves are because they're obviously the ones that you can just kind of pull straight back without anything. Like I'm not gonna grab one of these guys down here because there's a leaf on top of it. So I'm just gonna rotate it and grab the one that's on the outside and just kind of peel it off. And if they break, it's fine. Don't worry, because we're gonna chop it up anyway. And any of the little bits, you can just kind of toss into the compost. And I'm just going to essentially unfurl this entire head of romaine lettuce. Just by grabbing the outer leaves. And I probably don't need the entire head. 
But I don't know what else I'm going to do with the rest of this, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. I, I can toss it into a salad if I need to later. Because this isn't going to get any dressing or anything on it. And once you get down to kind of like the heart, you can just pop the whole thing off. I'll set that there. Oops. All right. I'm going to give that a sec to sit. I'm going to come over here and kind of mix this. You can see that things are starting to sit. They're starting to kind of stick to the bottom of the pan. Even if I'm moving things around, I've got this little layer down here that's starting to burn. And that's exactly what I want. I'm building that fond at the bottom of the pan, just like you would with a chicken or a steak. I'm getting all those little burn bits down at the bottom. It's difficult to see with cast iron because the cast iron itself is black. So you can't really see that there's like a, a brown film starting to form on the bottom. But there absolutely is. And you can just tell things are sounding a little bit crispier. And you can see that in some of the meat here, I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera, but in person, you can see that some of the ends here are getting a little bit crispy and burnt. And that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. I'm cooking this whole thing on medium heat. I'm not going, I'm not going super hot. I'm not going, making sure not to go too low. But I want everything in the pan. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take whatever, whatever taco seasoning you're using. It can be this taco seasoning, which is what I use. I love Lowry's. I've made my own taco seasonings. Those are also good. Maybe you're using a low sodium version. It's all good. Whatever you want to use. Go ahead and open it. And we're going to pour this into the pan without any water. I'm trying to get it on as much of the meat as possible. You don't have to sprinkle it or anything, but, you know, just get it in the pan. What this does is it actually toasts some of the uh, spices that are in that mix, in that blend, before we add water to cook it in. So again, it adds just a little bit more depth of flavor to this. Thank you. Yes, this apron is, is pretty cool. Got it from a good friend of mine. We're going to go ahead and stir the spices into the meat. And the meat's going to stick to it because the meat has a bunch of grease in it. Beef fat, etc. And you're going to start smelling just a lovely toasty aroma from the spices and the ground beef. And that is what we want to do. Yum, yum, yum. Again, we're going to get it into a single layer. Nice and even. And now we're going to add our water to the pan. And you want to hear that sizzle because what's happening is you're actually, all of those brown bits that are on the bottom of the pan are releasing and coming up into essentially what's a beef broth. We're making like a pan sauce for the taco meat. Go ahead and get in there and start stirring. We're actually going to turn this down to a medium or a medium low. We just want this down to a simmer. And if you kind of scrape around on the bottom of the pan, you'll notice that I'm just going to pick up the pan. A lot of those brown bits are gone. They've released off of the bottom of the pan, and they've gone into this kind of gravy for the taco meat. So we're just going to get this totally stirred, and stirring is incorporating the water with all of the spices and everything and getting it to absorb into the, the broth, basically, the, the, the gravy. And we want this to come up to just a very gentle simmer. You're also helping to scrape all those brown bits off of the bottom of the pan. This is what we want. It smells amazing. All right. I'm going to play with the temperature here to get it up to what I'm going to say is kind of a more active simmer. Here we go. Then I'm going to kick it back down. What I'm trying to do is just evenly heat everything, get it up to a point where it will simmer kind of on its own. Then I'll turn it down and let it simmer very low. Something like that. I just kind of want it moving. I just kind of want it like simmering, for lack of a better word. I don't want it boiling. If it starts boiling too fast, the water will evaporate too quickly, and it won't absorb all of that flavor. It'll just evaporate. So we're going to let this kind of simmer. While this simmers, we're going to head over to the sink and wash all of this lettuce. 
So welcome to the return of the sink cam. I'm taking all of the lettuce that we have. I've actually got a pot over here drying that I'm going to use to kind of set it in. And all I'm doing is running this through the water. Sometimes there are little gnats and things that are kind of in the head of lettuce. You want to make sure that they get washed off. And I've actually found that if I don't wash my lettuce, especially romaine, and I just kind of start using it, it's got a bitter flavor. And I'm assuming that's some kind of a pesticide, as kind of gross as that sounds. But you know what? Even organic lettuce kind of has that weird flavor. It's just bitter. But I find that if I just rinse it off, that bitter flavor goes away completely. So there's something about rinsing your lettuce, whether it's actually dirty or not. And then, of course, the dirtier it is, if it's actually like dirt, dirty lettuce, like maybe you got it from your garden and there's a bunch of compost or whatever on it, you know, give it a more thorough wash as you need to. But usually I just kind of give it a quick rinse. And the fact that we separated all of the leaves from that head of romaine lettuce means that we're actually able to get in there and kind of wash them one leaf at a time, which gives you just much better coverage for everything that you're rinsing off. And of course, any small pieces are chef's choice. I'm going to pull these back out of that pot that I have over here drying. Shake them off. And I can flip that pot back over to dry again. Ha ha! Maybe. More difficult than it looks one-handed. Back to the cutting board! Alright. So we are back at the cutting board. We've got all of our lettuce. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to kind of layer the lettuce with the smaller leaves on the inside and the bigger leaves on the outside. It doesn't have to be perfect. This literally does not matter. This is just me being OCD. If you're OCD kind of like I am, absolutely. But I mean, I'll take a small leaf like this and just kind of put it on top. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. We're going to cut this all up anyway. I just tend to be a bit more anal, for lack of a better word. about getting them to kind of fit nicely with one another than I'm sure your average cook would be. There we go. And I'm going to take the kind of fluffy, leafy ends and put them on the side that I'm going to start cutting from. And I'm going to work towards the kind of stalk ends where there's less leaf. And we're going to use the exact same technique that we used earlier. But before we start cutting, we're going to give our ground beef a little stir because I'm sure that a lot of that moisture has started to evaporate. You want to make sure that this is not burning to the bottom of the pan. And in fact, it may be time to turn this down because we can see that it's actually starting to simmer a bit more actively than what I want. I'm just going to turn it down to like 220. That's technically the temperature at which water boils, but sometimes, depending on what you're cooking, it might be a little bit too low if there's too much stuff in the pan. Eh, getting a little nerdy there. Anyway, I'm going to turn that down so that it doesn't stick to the pan. I'm going to come back to my lettuce, which I've kind of layered on top of itself. And again, we're going to use our little claw technique here, creating a flat shelf for our knife to go up and down. And we are just going to slice through our lettuce. You'll notice that I always keep my fingers curved backwards. It just minimizes any chance of me accidentally cutting my fingers because it's very hard for a knife to cut something that's not there. And if I have to grab and like re, you know, kind of consolidate things together, you'll notice I will always stop cutting. I won't try to move my fingers around while the knife is moving. There we go. And of course, you can cut this in batches. If a huge stack of lettuce like this is just too much for you, that's fine. Make it a couple smaller batches. Makes it much easier. And if I'm really going for super, super microscopic thin slices, that's what I end up doing just because it gives you more control. There we 
go. Now for some of those smaller leaves, the stalk end isn't really thick, so if you chop it up into the mixed lettuce, it's not a big deal. For some of these larger stalks, let's look at something like this. This is a pretty thick piece of lettuce. I might actually kind of stop it there. And I'm not going to go and cut individually each piece of lettuce to do that, but I'm going to eyeball it and say, all right, cool, I'm getting pretty close to the end. This one here I'm kind of pushing away, that's fine. Really, this is the only couple of pieces that I have left that I want to keep cutting. Maybe that one. Everything else I'm just going to kind of throw in the compost. There we go. Doop, 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 doop. And again, when you get more and more comfortable with this style of cutting and chopping, you can do it a little quicker. If you're not super comfortable with it, don't push yourself to go super fast. There's no reason for it. Unless you're in a restaurant environment where every second matters, doesn't matter. There we go. And again, just kind of like that end I'm going to get rid of. And now I've got a nice stack of lettuce to go along with my nice stack of cheese. And I'm just going to give this kind of a real quick mix. I don't even know if mix is really the right word. I just kind of want to fluff it up. And then I'll just set it up here. And we've got lettuce, we've got cheese, we've got our salsa and guacamole that we made before. And all we're doing is waiting on our meat. All of these little bits we can toss into the compost or just snack on them. Low calorie crunchies are good. Mm -hmm. There we go. Get our meat kind of loosened up, and we are pretty much done. This looks perfect. Mm-hmm. Get that turned off. And there we go. We got salsa, we got guac. Of course, we made that uh, the day before. We made it last night. Um, honestly, if you can, if you have the opportunity to make the salsa and guacamole a day before, it's better because all the flavors tend to kind of infuse a little bit more thoroughly, gives it a more even flavor. Uh, we made our beef. Again, we kind of diced it up out of the container onto a plate, seasoned it just a little bit, let it sit in the fridge for a couple of hours. You can do that overnight if you want to. It intensifies the beefiness of the of, of the beef, for lack of a better word, and uh, dries it out a little bit so you get nice little crispy bits as well. And then we got our cheese and our lettuce all prepped while the meat cooked. And now all we got left to do is plate it up and eat. Mm -hmm. So, I'm partial to crunchy tacos. I know a lot of people who would prefer to have more street taco style with the soft corn or flour tortillas. I, I like the crunchy. So I'm going for the crunchy tacos. And I always fill them up with meat over the pan just so that anything that falls over goes back in. You know what I like to do? I actually like to put just a small layer of salsa on top of the beef. The salsa tends to be a little bit cooler than everything else, <clears throat> and it's robust, so it can take a little bit of that heat without wilting, like the lettuce. And then, of course, I scoop some more in to enjoy it that way. On top of the salsa, this is where I put my lettuce. This also serves the purpose of, if you lay your taco down, this also doesn't out of the taco shell because the lettuce is there to kind of hold it.
And then on top of all of that, just a nice little sprinkling of cheese. Just like so. And then if you want, I don't usually do this because I like to kind of eat it on its own. But you can put some guacamole on top, or you can put the guacamole on top of the lettuce so that the cheese has something to stick to. It's really up to you. I don't usually put guacamole on top. I'll usually just eat the guacamole as a side. Mm -hmm. And then I love this hot taco sauce. Not really a salsa, but it does add a nice spice to the taco. Put some grip. Ooh, that guy's on there. There we go. This is how I like to do my tacos. A little bit of sauce, cheese, salsa, lettuce, beef, nom. We'll switch down here. From the top, again, we went beef, we went salsa, then we went lettuce, and that keeps the salsa from kind of pouring out if you have to set the taco down. Uh, guacamole, if you want, cheese on top of that so that the cheese has something to stick to. And then add any taco sauce if you need to. Yum, yum. Sink cam, rinsing romaine. Yeah, every time. Every single time. It's not a hot plate, Nini. It's an induction stove. Oh, yep. Hobby got it. It's awesome. Hey, Joff. How's it going, buddy? Taco shell. Yep, you can do taco shells yourself. I love them as well. Yeah, Nini, absolutely. Um, good, corn, corn, good corn tortillas are going to be better than this. I would still rather have them crunchy. I like crispy stuff. So for me, that's just a texture preference. I'm not going to turn down tacos if somebody gives me, you know, nice fresh corn tortilla tacos. I'm not going to be like, oh, it's not crunchy. I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to devour it just like I would devour a crunchy taco. Um, however, if I have the choice, I'm going to go crunchy. And homemade shells are also really good. Yeah. Cool, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and eat my tacos thanks for joining me on this first cook along live of 2023 um we will be back next week with another cook along live i'm going to try to hit 56 weeks this year of cooking along live and i've got a couple of international trips planned so we're gonna see how well that works but i've got some ideas on what to cook and how to uh live stream while international so that's gonna be a lot of fun and i'm gonna do some local stuff while i'm out wherever i'm at so we'll see how that ends up working. Have a great year. We're off to a great start with tacos. I hope you guys have a chance to make some of these yourself. I know I make tacos on this channel all the time. It's because I love them. They're easy, they're tasty, and they last a couple of days with leftovers. So give them a shot. Give them a shot. And I'll see you guys next week. By the way, another reminder, I said it at the beginning. If you guys go to cookalong.live, the website, there is now a link on the top that says upcoming live streams. And you can click on that to get a link to the actual video beforehand. So when I have that all set up, the link will go up. There'll be a video that you can just click on to get to this YouTube broadcast, as well as all of the ingredients and probably a little bit of a story about why we're cooking what we're cooking, all on one page. So if you're ever curious, hey, is Rob doing a live stream next weekend? Is it Saturday or is it Sunday? Is it maybe Friday night? All of that information will be on that page so that you guys have one spot to go and look. And you don't have to go and find me on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, although I do recommend it because I post stuff on all of them, um, to find when the next Cook Along Live will be. Have a great evening. Happy New Year. Bye.